Shannon, thank you so much for joining me again for the third time on Lynch with a Leader. It is so good to have you. It is my honor to be with you and to catch up and just have a good conversation. Well, you just keep popping out books, Shannon. I mean, you just, I can't <laughs> keep up. You just keep, tell me when you wrote Women of the Bible Speak, did you imagine, okay, I can do something on mothers and daughters. Where, where did that whole idea germinate from? You know what? I don't think any of us would have, if we're being honest, thought that it would have connected with people the way that it did women of the Bible speak. But listen, you know, the stories, the Bible is full of them. We knew there were a lot of other women that we could talk about and that we could tell stories about. So we thought, gosh, people seemed hungry for this. We got great feedback, people telling me they were using it in Bible studies and book groups. And I, I love to include the st study questions yep. so people could do those kinds of conversations. So we're like, there's still a lot to talk about and these amazing women. So let's do this a slightly different angle. This time will be through family, parenthood and kids and, and complicated dynamics of families and relationships. And so uh, that birthed the number two book in this series. You know, it's funny you hit that. It's not like families just got complicated. <laughs> families, families, <laughs> families in the Bible had some crazy uncles and there was some, there was some crazy oh, yeah. stuff going on. And even in the mm -hmm. Bible, and we don't know all that till we dig into it a little bit. Mm -hmm. And um, you know what I love is that people who maybe are intimidated by the Bible, I, those are the folks I hope will pick up these books along with people who know the word and want to study it and get more in depth with it. Um, because I think people will say to me like, oh my goodness, I had no idea these stories were in there about, you know, King David, we, we look at his relationship with his father-in-law and, you know, King Saul and his daughter, Michal, who, you know, marries David. And what a nightmare it is where, you know, King Saul's literally multiple times trying to murder David. So imagine being the daughter that's caught between your dad and your husband, and there is a constant attempt to kill him. Um, yep. So people are like, what? That's in the Bible? And it's like, oh, yeah, there are severely dysfunctional families. But the good thing is that God works through flaws and dysfunction right. and messes and disobedience, all kinds of things. Um, when we come back to him, he can still work through all of it. You know, I've heard you talk multiple times. Your mom set a major example for you. Talk to me, and this is coming out the day after Mother's Day. Talk mm -hmm. to me about what made your mom such a great mom for you, Shannon. You know, it was, she definitely taught me through her words, but even more so through her actions, because mm -hmm. she is a person of faith, uh, a woman who is, you know, on her knees praying for folks and showing up with casseroles and she'll babysit and she'll clean your house. And like, she just the true hands and feet of Christ. And she really is in constant service to other people. I mean, whether it's strangers she meets at the grocery store and brings them home to have Sunday dinner with us because they have nowhere to go. Um, to people who've had to move in with us that, you know, our family, she's taking care of them. I mean, she's just really amazing in that respect, but she was constantly teaching me scripture and um, all of the things that were important to kind of pour into your child um, all through these years until I eventually was old enough to realize that, okay, this isn't something where I just coast off my mom's faith or my dad's faith. I have to make a personal commitment to Christ, but she guided me all through that. And she just continues to be the person I say, I want to be when I grow up. I love that. I love that. And, and, you know, you think if you could get back to some of these ladies, there would be so many stories that we don't even know right. that, that, that were happening around them. I love what you did bringing out uh, the story of Jacobet and Miriam. So let's talk mm -hmm. about, we all know the great leader, Moses, everybody mm -hmm. knows Moses, but without these two, there is no deliverer of Israel. Unpack that a little bit. And what was it about those two that really fascinated you? Gosh, this mother and daughter worked together. They were brave. Uh, they stood up to an evil ruler who wanted all of the Hebrew baby boys dead. And that was including Moses. And you have to kind of set the scene and think about the fact that they were essentially slaves. The Hebrew people had been enslaved by Egypt. These were women who really did not have choices in life. I mean, they were oppressed. Um, their husbands, all of them, I mean, they were working under this grind of the Pharaoh who was telling them, you know, you got no other options. He was afraid because the Hebrews were being blessed by God and they were flourishing. And he threw down this edict. You're going to have to, anytime a baby is born to the Hebrew people and it's a boy, it has to be thrown into the Nile and killed. I can't imagine, yeah. you know, being a person of faith and, 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 and a mother in the middle of that thinking about your pregnancy, um, Jochebed, she chose to have a family, you know, she decided to move forward in faith. And so that whole time of her pregnancy, 
I, I think about all these Hebrew women having to think, is this going to be a baby girl that we can love and keep and adore? Or am I going to face losing my child if, if this baby is born and he's a boy? I can't imagine the enormous mixed emotions during pregnancy. But Jochebed, we're told when she had Moses and she saw him in several places in scripture, it talks about some kind of view she had of him, that there was something special about him. Of course, every mom loves their baby. They're special to every mama, but it's almost the suggestion in the original languages that he was had a special destiny or a special covering by God kind of thing. So she defies Pharaoh and says, I'm keeping this baby. She hides him for a few months. And then there comes a point where she can't do that anymore. And so she makes this little arc, this little you know, waterproof basket he goes into and Miriam goes along as he's put into the Nile, which I find so ironic, the very place he was going to be sent to die yep. is where he ends up finding life because little Miriam is along the borders and uh, of the river there. And she's watching Pharaoh's daughter, hears him crying and lifts him out. And we're told the Bible says that she has compassion on him. And she decides I want to raise this baby. Well, Miriam, little slave girl jumps out of the bushes and says, Hey, if you need a Hebrew woman to nurse and to take care of him, I know somebody. And I can't imagine the joy she must have had in running back to her mother. Like you did this brave thing. You refused to kill this child. You set him out in faith on the Nile. Pharaoh's daughter wants to raise him. And guess what? I bought you another two or three years with him. So by the time he ends up going into the Pharaoh's, um, into his palace and to be raised by Pharaoh's daughter, he's already been prayed over and sung over and told everything you could tell a two or three-year-old about their faith and about their heritage and their blessing from God. So he goes into Pharaoh's household knowing all those things because of Jochebed and Miriam. You know, and you think about that word for her, that word selfless. And I don't know if there's a word that encompasses our moms better than mm -hmm. selfless. You know, they're always thinking of others, but the thought of the selfless act of I'm going to give up what I want for the betterment of my child. How many times did you see selfless women be portrayed mm -hmm. in these stories, Shannon? Oh, over and over again. I mean, having to, I think about Hannah, she was mm. in uh, the last book too. We talk about how she would go up to the temple and just pray and cry and sob out to God because she wanted a child and she was barren. Not only that, but she had a sister wife. Her husband had another wife as was custom at the time. Yep. That's something I got to ask about when I get to heaven, because I would never be good at we that. We didn't hear that at um, Liberty. I don't understand. No, I didn't no, say that in goodness, any of my class notes. Thank goodness that is not still a thing <laughs> for us, and at least in our Western culture, for the most part, I, because I just, you know, I would not have done well with that. Um, there are some people who choose that. Okay. Yeah. In the Bible, I don't think there was a ton of choice. That was the culture at the time. And so what happens is um, this other wife has sons and daughters. We're told multiple children in the Bible, and she is constantly antagonizing poor Hannah, who is not only strung over being barren, but is now constantly having salt thrown in her wound um, by this other wife, Penina, who's saying, mocking her and taunting her about this, this deep hole in her heart. And she goes to the temple and prays and, and says to God, you know, please hear my prayer. And um, Eli, the priest sees her and thinks she's drunk. That's how emotional and passionate mm, she is. In this mm. prayer. He tries to kick her out of the temple and she's like, oh no, no, no. Um, you know, I, I am your humble servant. I am here praying and pouring out my heart to God over deep need. And he says, you know, may it be granted and, and sends her away with blessing. And she eventually becomes pregnant with Samuel. And what she does is the most selfless thing in the world once she weans him. So again, probably around three years old, she takes him back to the temple and says to the priest, Eli, this is what I was praying about this little boy and I promised God I would give him to you. So here he is. Mm. And, you know, she lived a long travel away from where that was. It wasn't like she could go see him every day. This was a once a year trip they made to the temple. And I think what a humble, selfless, brave thing to do. This child you had longed for so much and prayed for so much to say, God, I told you I would give him to you in service, which is what Samuel spent his life doing. And I can't imagine anything more selfless than that from a mama. That is so good. And you know, we, we look at correlations between then and now, and we learn lessons. And I think we talked about this last time. God left us these stories mm -hmm. to give us hope, to give us encouragement, and to let us know there's been others that have traveled these roads before. I loved your take on Naomi and Ruth. I think yeah. we all think about the story of Naomi and Ruth. What was it about that story and how their story spoke to your heart? 
there's so much there. They start out in tragedy. But now, first of all, Naomi has gone away from her homeland, gone to Moab because there was a great famine and drought. She's gone to Moab. And while she and her husband are there, they have their two sons who marry two local Moabite women. Well, then this tragedy strikes in that Naomi loses her husband. So the father is gone. Then both of her sons are gone. They die. So we have three widows bound together in marriage now. And she says to them, you are young. Go start a new family. Stay with your families. That would make sense you can still have children, the whole thing. Well, Ruth is her one daughter-in-law that says, I am not leaving you. Mm. And that passage we hear used in weddings so yeah. often, entreat me not to leave you. Where you go, I will go. Your God will be my God. Your people would be my people because now Naomi's going to travel back home. Things are better at home. So she was the outsider in Moab and now she's bringing back her Moabite daughter-in-law with her, where she's going to be an outsider. And what a powerful thing that she's saying, not only I'm going to leave my people, which was a huge deal back then, but she said, uh, your God will be my God. So, you know, there was very much a part of the culture that the gods you grew up with and that your family worshiped and your nation worshiped, that was what you did. But there must have been something in Naomi, um, almost maybe an evangelistic twist to the way that she served God and followed God, even in the worst of circumstances that Ruth said, that's going to be my God. I'm going with you. So they go back and you think about the fact that at that time to not have a male in the home was to be very um, vulnerable. They didn't have a provider. They didn't have a protector, but these two women stuck together out of choice. Um, They were bound by marriage, but there was no legal obligation or moral obligation in those days for Ruth to stay with Naomi, but that's what she did. And so they live on the edges of poverty and Boaz, this wealthy landowner who is a distant relative of Naomi's, he takes note of the fact that Ruth is showing up and gleaning just for whatever teeny scraps are left behind um, after the fields have already been harvested that she and Naomi are sticking together, living in poverty. He sees her and he knows that she's an honorable woman because of what she's done with Naomi. Me. And eventually there are some twists and turns, which I love about the Bible. You couldn't even script these things, but it turns into this beautiful love story and redemption between Boaz and Ruth. And they end up in the lineage of Christ eventually. Yeah. And Naomi has this enormous celebration after all of her grief at the very end, saying that God has blessed her more than if she'd had many, many sons um, by she and Ruth surviving this and having this precious grandbaby who is in that lineage of Christ. Such a beautiful story. And, you know, you you think of the Naomi and Ruth story, and many of us know that story, but then you take the story of Bathsheba. You know, we've yeah. heard Bathsheba mentioned in scripture, but usually she's the one you stay away from. She's the one that, <laughs> that is, you know, she's the, she's the villain. She's the villain mm-hmm. in everybody's sermon, everybody's story, but that's not your take on Bathsheba. Mm-hmm. And And if you were to talk to Solomon or you to talk to anybody else, tell us a little bit about what drew you to want to talk about and study Bathsheba. You know, I grew up with that impression too, um, that she was sort of the seductress who was looking to entrap King David. And when you go to the scripture, which should always be our guide, um, it doesn't tell that story. What it says is that all the men were off to battle, off to war, as was the time and the custom, including Bathsheba's husband. King David should have been with them. And he wasn't. Mm -hmm. So that sparks questions. He's on his rooftop at night. He looks down and sees her doing what would have been her ritual cleansing, um, something that she would have been supposed to do. And so that sets up, okay, well, what was the situation there? He's clearly looking down on her when he should have been away at war. But then he asks about her, which is the real clincher for me, because he asks and and sends word about her. And he's told who her father is. And he says, oh, yeah, and you know her husband, Uriah, he's off at war. So David's already been told exactly who she is, that she is a married woman. We don't see anything that she knows anything about what's going on. And he summons her to the palace. There's a huge, of course, power deferential there. We have no idea. I don't want to speculate, but, you know, did she think there was word of Uriah? She couldn't have known, but she was called to the palace and we're told nothing really about their interaction, except that she ends up going home and being pregnant. And then the, the misdeeds and the sin and the treachery that happens from there is horrific. So 
that's the part of the story that I knew. But after digging in, like, okay, there's more to this. David is responsible for what happened there. But then I'd forgotten that she's actually the mother right. of King Solomon, whom we're told is the wisest man ever to live. That when God said to him, what do you want? He said, I want discernment so I can lead your people well. That God said, I'm going to give you that. And because you didn't ask for the fame and fortune and all that good stuff, you're going to get that too. And we see the Bathsheba makes a return in, in really being a key player and making sure that he ascends to the throne when there is a competition over which of David's sons would make it. And um, she's esteemed as sort of a queen mother that Solomon has great reverence and respect for her as part of his kingdom and as part of his leadership. So there's really so much more to her story. And I feel like, gosh, I didn't give her a, a fair shake up until now. And, and I'm really glad that I got to dig in and know her better. And I hope the readers will too. You know, it's, it's the great picture that God can use anybody's story. Mm -hmm. God can use anybody's story, no matter even how it starts, he can redeem that story and he mm -hmm. can, he can pick up that story. The last person I want to talk to you about, and I thought your take on her was so fascinating was mother, the Mary of Christ. And mm -hmm. you called her a, a refugee and yeah. you, you took the angle of Mary isn't just this quaint person who we pictured as this perfect woman that's pictured in Catholicism as this perfect woman. She was a young little girl, a long ways from home who had to do the one thing that no mom wants to do and watch her child suffer. When you stepped into Mary's shoes, Shannon, and you thought about what it must have been like to watch her son grow, knowing where this was going, what did it do to you? Yeah, it, I, I think it's got to be every mom's worst possible nightmare that you could think. Just to lose your child would be the worst thing that you can probably imagine. But in the way that she lost him and the fact that she knew that he was lied about and that he was tortured and that she had to watch him die. I cannot imagine the strength it must have taken for her not to turn away and to leave. I can't imagine. And there were so many things along the way. We, we actually have a lot of information about Mary in scripture from the very beginning when she finds out that she's going to have this divine assignment and willingly takes it on. Um, to raising Jesus, to being on the run from King Herod as a refugee um, with no warning in the middle of the night, grabbing her child and going um, with Joseph after he was warned in a dream, to watching his ministry, um, having to balance the fact that you're raising this boy and she had other children. She and Joseph had other children, um, but you know, he's the son of God and, and how tricky that must have been. And, you know, she was told in a prophecy when she took him to the temple, she and Joseph took him to the temple for his blessing and for all of the rituals of him as a little baby, um, that there was Simeon was there, it was a prophet who, who talked about how um, there would be a piercing and that there would be pain in his life and for her too. And I got to think in the back of her head, she always wondered how this would play out and like, what is that painful part about? Because, you know, the Jewish people were watching for a redeemer, somebody to come and break all the curses of you know, um, oppression and mistreatment and to save them. And I got to think she I didn't really have an exact idea with how this was going to turn out, but not only was she there and supportive and faithful to the bitter end, we see even after that, after he has been resurrected and many of the disciples are under threat now, and the people who follow Jesus are under threat because, um, you know, they had pledged their loyalty to him and the religious leaders of the day, most of them um, were absolutely opposed and thought that he was a blasphemer. Um, but we see that she's in the upper room praying with the disciples. So she doesn't chicken out at any point. I mean, she continues to be faithful through uh, the end and beyond actually of his life. You know, there's a lot of common threads that run between all these stories, really through both books. They run through these stories. And one of them is, there's a waiting season in a lot of these stories. There's the promises may be made and there's a faithfulness in it, but these ladies and their children experience waiting. Mm -hmm. Why is it so important for people to understand that waiting is part of the process of living out the plan that God has for us in our lives? Yeah. And I would imagine everybody has experienced that at some point where you think it's going to go one way, or you think you were on the cusp of this answer and you're left in that period of waiting. And that's another thing I find so encouraging. Like you said, looking back at all these stories from thousands of years ago in that you could see, we have, you know, hindsight is 2020. We have the privilege and the blessing of being able to see how God was working in those periods of waiting and why they were 
purposeful. Like, I don't think that God ever wastes pain Mm -hmm. or waiting. I think that we're learning through all of it and we can't always see how he's working. I talked about Hannah and the waiting for Samuel and the pain that she went through in that and how he went on to be born and she gives him back to God. And he's this powerful prophet um, key in the um, trajectory of Israel coming together as a nation and selecting King David and all of the things that happened. Um, I also talk about Elizabeth and Mary who were cousins in the Bible and Elizabeth and her husband, Zachariah, when we meet them in Luke had been waiting decades for a baby. And I got to think they had almost given up at some point because when Zachariah, who was a faithful priest goes to in service um, for, they would have twice a year, one week at a time. And he got chosen by lot to go in to do this uh, offering of incense, which you could be your priest for your whole life and never, ever come close to having that chance because there were thousands of them. But he goes in and the angel Gabriel comes in there and tells him, um, God has heard your prayer. So he, mm-hmm. at that point, he and Elizabeth are, are old. They're sort of like the, the Abraham and Sarah of the New Testament. And he has some disbelief, like, whoa, we're way past this. At, and now we're going to have a child. Um, but I think about the fact that that baby is John the Baptist, who is going to be the one uh, to open the way for Christ in his ministry. So these two cousins, Elizabeth, who's way past the point anybody would thought would have thought she'd be having a baby, including her and Elizabeth uh, and Mary, her cousin, who is a youngster who nobody thought, you know, she hadn't been with a man, wasn't married, shouldn't be having a baby. And the two of them walked through this together so that John the Baptist was born a few months before Jesus. And then these two babies were in ministry together. Um, and so I think about the waiting for Elizabeth and, and what at what point she and Zachariah may have given up on having a baby, but you can see God's perfect timing. And that these two cousins had these babies who were so intertwined in ministry um, that it all made sense, the timing, um, when you can look at it from God's perspective. You know that you've grown up in it. You've gone to you've gone to a great school. You've gone to church. Why is waiting so hard for Shannon Breen? You mm-hmm. know, you know all these mm-hmm. truths. Why is waiting so hard for you? What would you say? Yeah, you know what? I think back when I got fired from my very first TV job. You know, I was a lawyer for a few years before I got into TV, and apparently I had a lot to learn um, because I was told I was the worst person on TV, and I would never make it, and I should get out of the business immediately. And that was really humbling and embarrassing and painful. And I went months and months and months before I ever got anyone to call me back to look at my videos or to look at my resume. And I jokingly say, but in the middle of all those months of waiting, at where I would pray, like, Lord, have I done the wrong thing? I thought this career change was what you had for me. Um, I remember sort of half jokingly saying to God, like, all right, I've experienced enough of this. And I, I have a head knowledge enough about the need for patience and waiting. So if you could just go ahead and drop the lesson on me mm, and right. we could fast forward to the end of this painful period, but it doesn't work that way. I've over and over again in my life seen that God always has better timing, a better plan. And, um, I've really struggled in some of those times there have been valleys and darkness, and I have to cling to his promises and say, God, if you're not going to solve this for me right now, walk me through it. Um, I know he is ever present, even in the worst trouble and the worst times and, and in the waiting and in the pain. So, um, I like to think as a, as a Christian, who's been at this for a few decades now, um, I'm never going to be perfect or mature enough until I get to heaven. That's but right. I think I've learned enough along the way to know that even if things are painful and I don't like it and I, I question God and I think that he can handle that, he can handle our questions as a human being and he knows that we're human and he is there to answer them, um, that hopefully I've gained enough of a level of maturity that the next time that trial or that waiting time comes that I can rest in it. Like, okay, we've been here before. You've been mm. faithful and I'm just going to wait. You know, as we look at all these characters too, and we look at even our own lives, there's no straight path. There's no, the path of faith is a crooked journey. It's sort of like the, the, the Israelites wandering in the wilderness. When you look at the map, I mean, they're just sort of, and that's how we feel with our right. faith sometimes. <laughs> what would you challenge people that are going, Shannon, I just want my life to make more sense. I just want this to be easy. Learning what you've learned through your own faith journey, learning what you've learned through all these amazing characters, what would you tell them about that walk of faith in their lives? And what would you say to encourage them? Yeah, I feel like early on, I probably had the wrong impression as a young girl that if you do things right and you, um, you know, you memorize your verses and you don't sin and you try to do everything the right way, life is going to be good and it's going to be smooth and easy. But 
that's not ever what we're taught. I mean, Christ said in John, um, you know, you will have trouble in this world, but um, I have overcome it. Like have no fear in that. Um, I think about one of the very first verses my mom taught me was um, God has not given me the spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. And I think that it is helpful to call on scripture when we're really struggling. Um, But to know that life isn't going to be easy. Mine has it. Yours has it. I think anybody who really is endeavoring to do our best um, as Christians, and I am a sinner who needs forgiveness save my grace and mercy every single day of my life, um, we're going to stumble and we're going to have circumstances that come along. We would not choose for ourselves or for people that we love, but we do have God's promises that he is faithful to us. Um, one of my favorite verses, Psalm 34, four, I sought the Lord and called out to him and he delivered me from all my fears. I mean, um, we can go through tough things. It is human to be fearful. It's human to ask questions but God will walk through it with us, not promising us a safe journey, but promising that he will be with us when it's hard. And that's when we need him the most. And I gotta be honest with you, that's when I've been closest to him in my life is when I've been in the darkest, worst valleys, rock bottom, he has shown up there for me. Even if it's just a comfort in my spirit to say, I'm with you. Not I'm gonna solve this problem and heal you and take you out of this, but I'm with you. And he is with you, whatever you are struggling with, he's not abandoned you. He, he knows the hairs on your head. He knows everything that you are worried about and every trauma and every crisis that you have um, right now. And he's with you in it. His presence is there. Um, call on that. And, and that's what I pray a lot of times for people when I know they're struggling. We've got a lot of people that uh, are close to us that are going through terrible diagnoses and trouble. And I say, God, let them feel your presence. If you're not going to heal them and pull them out of this right now, let it be unmistakable that they feel your presence and know you are with them in this.